Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to The Slave Master, The Slave Hunter and The Slave Part 3. And this very important notice to you, our dear viewer, that it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with our videos. Please look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications or sources referenced and study them yourself. Remember, Mohammedanism also gives the sanction of religion to the slave trade and even enjoins it as a mode to converting the hayden that people are kafiring and do not say their prayers, the dogs, a sufficient reason for the true believers, making war upon them and carrying them into slavery. T.F. Buxton, Esquire, 1811, and this is from the book, The African Slave Trade, Part 2, The Remedy. And from A.F. Mokla Ferryman in 1902, it is perhaps needless to mention that the Hausas are responsible for the state of prosperity at which Kano has arrived. They alone furnish the industrial class and the merchants, the fullers preferring the excitements of slave raiding, always a most lucrative employment. And before we go into our topic of today, here is a little look at YouTube censorship. We got this comment from someone called Hollywood Hansen. I can tell you without a doubt that most of the blacks in America know we are not Indians. We know that the Indians enslaved us just like the whites did and that fought on the side of the white supremacy during the Civil War to keep us enslaved. So why would any black Americans believe they are Indians? My family been here in America for 400 years and we have suffered at the hands of the whites and the enemy within the black community in America. But we are tired of white supremacy and racism. We will fight these folks until we are truly free. That's why you see us in the streets of America. So we replied this comment and said, You are right that the Negroes now called African Americans in the USA are not Indians. But the slave master is working to change their identity same way they did from Ethiopians to Grometers to Guineans and to Colots and to Afro-Americans and Negroes and to Black Americans and then to African Americans and now to Niji Indian or Aborigine. You can see their new tools for the propagation of the new identity in the likes of the Nkalawe, Kurimu Ahau and others. Today, people know they are lying. But remember, the slave master is a subtle beast and his targets are the next generations. Remember, African American was not invented in 1988, but existed even in the 1800s. But he deployed Jesse Jackson in 1988 to apply that change of identity on the Negroes then. And that's what he is trying to do now anyway. We can only do what we can by educating our people and exposing the lies of the slave master as well as the gang up and conspiracy against the Negroes. Thank you. However, soon after we posted this reply, YouTube removed it. We tried it a second time. It was still removed by their algorithms, which will tell you or should tell you that the slave master is actually behind the Indian and Aboriginal narrative of the likes of the Nkaloe or Kurimu Ahau. You can at least see that our comments were not offensive but are just based on historical facts, but YouTube removes them. So you notice that this was one hour after the comment was made and it was removed. You notice it no longer has replies. Whereas when we made the reply was when it was 36 minutes old. We made the reply and took this screenshot a second after we made it. But by the time we checked again, after about an hour, they had removed it. It had no replies anymore. And so you can always check us out at library.tv, that's where we are also hosting some of our videos, in fact most of them, and your comments there will not be censored, so you can check us out there on that 
platform. Recall from parts 1 and 2 of this same series that we showed the records of who the slave hunters were and that it was never the arrow. We also showed that slave raiding was a military affair and never done by individuals and couldn't have been done by an individual. Think about it. Imagine how they could have taken a man, his wife and his entire family and children and mother his grandparents and you are telling us it could have been an individual. That doesn't make sense. And we also saw how the slave master sold the dummy of Negroes selling themselves even when they were supposedly animals and how it was impossible for animals to have sold themselves. So if the Negroes were animals, there is no way cattle could have sold cattle. And how Negroes, supposedly animals, couldn't have conducted human sacrifices as pagans. Remember, there is no way to suggest that if Negroes were not human and they sacrificed one of their own, if we assumed without considering that the slave master's lie of human sacrifices were true, then there is no way it could be human sacrifices because Negroes were supposedly not human. So you see how the lies of the slave master collapses the moment you apply first principles to them. And so in this part, first we shall establish that the slave master deceived the Negroes with his golden calves of the so-called Abrahamic religions and took away the true relationship with the creator, which was nature, that the Negroes had at that time which was ideally their immunity. And then we shall continue to examine the accounts of the slave masters and how they got the Negro slaves from the slave hunters. Remember, they got the slaves from the hunters and they are still working together with the hunters till tomorrow morning. And we shall also see how the slave masters work with their slave hunting partners to change the narratives and accounts of their slaveries. Remember, without those enemies within, the enemies outside could do us no harm. That's ideally what the slave hunting partners of the slave masters are doing today, which we shall continue to elucidate in our videos. And to show our very simple proof of the golden calf, let us reference the story of Africa and its explorers by Robert Brown, MA, PhD. And this was published 1911. And here we are told that schools were plentiful most of the people could read books of law and theology were not uncommon and though the mosques were numerous the natives were not then any more than they are now by gutted mohammedans remember we cited in our previous video while the mohammedans were teaching the people early enough and he goes on to say most of the towns were well fortified considering the force likely to be brought against them the reason was that the fullers that's the fulanese were a warlike people capable of placing 16,000 men in the field and prone to hostilities against their neighbors since they could not obtain european goods without slaves nor slaves without making war however only the young and strong were taken the old and feeble to avoid trouble had their truths cut, but they excused themselves for this barbarity by declaring that the people whom they thus raided, robbed and murdered never prayed to God, and that as the European factories would sell guns, powder and cloth for no other articles except black men and women, the people whom the travelers tried to persuade into more peaceful pursuits had no alternative. Moreover, did not the book, the Quran, enjoin on the faithful to make war against the infidel? But our interest is where it said, however, only the young and strong were taken, the old and feeble to avoid trouble had their throats cut. So what does it mean by to avoid trouble? So imagine where someone came to capture slaves, take all the ones that are young and good enough to be taken and then murder the old why do you think they will be doing that to avoid trouble what does it mean by that trouble remember the slave master is a subtle beast you have to read his accounts with a lot of attention to details remember also that they said they were killing them or murdering them because they never prayed to god and from what we just read it means the god they are talking about here would be the mohammedan god which will be allah and remember the slaves were being sold to the Europeans who also worshipped their own god 
which is the one they call God in English or Jehovah, as the case may be. So our interest is for you to get the full context here. So if the God they were worshipping in coming to capture the slaves was the true one, that means he wasn't the God of the Negroes and couldn't have protected them or wasn't protecting them. Whichever one you looked at, it doesn't mean that the new slave master's golden calves could have been the true ones because they still couldn't protect them and it's still not protecting them today. But then our interest is to establish that the slave master gave the Negroes the golden calf deliberately to deceive them and bring them out of the protection of the creator of heaven and earth or the spiritual forces that could have been protecting them. And so taking very good note of where it said to avoid trouble, the truths of the old were caught. Let's try to see if we can understand what they meant by avoiding trouble. And we shall do this by referencing the Matthias and the fugitive or a narrative of the captivity, sufferings and death of an African family and the slavery and escape of their son by Plath Smith. And this was published 1859. And here we are told why they are killing the old and aged people when they go on a slave raid and captured the young ones they could sell and it says then why did they kill the old people this is the question and the answer is because they were not fit for slaves and the africans believe that the relatives of those whom they have greatly injured may bewitch them in revenge so they kill them to avoid the power of their supposed witchcraft so now we ask you if the God of Islam allowed them to capture slaves and kill those they could not sell and the God of Christianity also allowed them to do the same. Does it not prove that they were afraid of whatever the Negroes had behind them, whether they call it witchcraft or paganism or whatever they chose to call it, doesn't matter. They have no right to define what the people were doing, but because they have evil intentions, that's why they figured to be killing them. And please don't get this wrong, you might say if they were actually calling or communing with the creator of heaven and earth, it should have been able to protect them or give them an idea of when the enemies who were the slave hunters would come and so on and so forth. But please remember that the Negroes are a unique people that even if they were told, they may not believe whoever told them. Remember they are very easy to deceive as well. You notice that today they are worshipping the gods of the oppressors, happily too. And above all, remember also that something must have prompted the slave hunters to start killing the aged ones, apparently when they left or did what they did, whatever they thought was the power of witchcraft may have been deployed by the negroes in some areas. For example, there were places where they went for slave raids and thunder scattered them. If you were to research it, you would see such cases and the slave master wouldn't tell you all those because he wants the negroes to be running after his golden calf, which makes him or renders the negroes vulnerable. Let us also reference documents illustrative of the history of the slave trade to America by Elizabeth Donan and this was published 1930 and here we are told that the Portuguese also caused the slaves they ship off to be baptized it being forbid under pain of excommunication to carry any to Brazil that are not Christian. So if there was nothing about the religion, why would the slave master give them to you? Think about it if you are a negro or a black person. If there was nothing about it that favors the slave master, why would he give it to you? Remember the slaves were captured by the Arabs and the Mohammedans. So they gave their own religion too. Their own condition was if you don't become Mohammedan, they were going to capture you. And so you see that today, the Negroes are the only people on earth that have two religions, both coming from their slave masters. And it goes further to say, however, it is pitiful to see how they crowd those poor wretches, 650 or 700 in a ship, the men standing in the hold, tied to stakes, the women between decks, and those that are with child in the great cabin and the children in the steerage which in that hot climate 
occasions an intolerable stench. So our challenge to you is to tell us how the Arab priest numbering less than 20 could have been behind this. If you notice, the slave master understands that the Negroes believe whatever master is saying and their slave hunting partners know that too. So that's why they are both able to deny their atrocities, blame it on a tiny group of people that are certainly insignificant in the real sense of it because if you look at the area covered by the slave trade and the area they are focusing on and the people they are talking about you will see that the slave master is a liar and his slave hunting partners are liars too they all know this so it doesn't matter if you believe us or not all you can do is pick up these materials and study them yourself and here is a map of the area from the same book we just referenced and you notice where he has things like dahomey benin Gold Coast, which is today rebaptized Ghana, Wider, which is the one you hear Hebrew Israelites call Judah, and something like that. And if you looked further down around where you have Calabar, please we want you to think Biafra and Ambazonia today. Remember to ask yourself why the slave masters media, be it Al Jazeera, VOA, CNN, and BBC, do not report on Biafra and Ambazonia. Why do they not? If they had no ulterior motives, if they had no hidden motives, they had no bad intentions, why do they not report on both of them? Ask yourself that simple question when you read these materials. You will begin to understand what we are talking about and what games they are playing. And then further down, you will see where we saw something very interesting. It calls the place Nazareth, which you can see on your screen and you can take it to any Hebrew Israelites to explain that to you. We don't know what it means. We don't know why it's there. We only know that one slave ship was sometime sunk by a British naval warship during the slave trade near where they called River Nazareth in the same area, very close to where they call Gaza, which you can also see on your screen in one of the maps. We don't understand those. Perhaps then the Hebrew Israelites will understand it and you might see them claim that oh that shows that they are the people chosen for slavery but common sense tells us that there is no father on earth let alone in heaven or anywhere else that would like the child to be abused by everyone else in the name of obedience and disobedience that doesn't make sense and we don't believe that narrative because we know the slave master wrote his book and so let us also reference african slave trade by rufus w clark and this was published 1860 and here we are told that a slave ship named Jehovah made three voyages between Brazil and Angola in 13 months of 1836 to 7 and landed 700 slaves the first voyage, 600 the second, and 520 the third. In all, 1,820 slaves. But our interest is the name of the slave ship and it is called Jehovah. So now we ask you if you know any Negro, Christian or Muslim or Jew that says he is worshipping Jehovah, how does he know which one he's calling and which language is it? What does it mean in any Negro language if it was the same God that could have ordained them for slavery? That's our question to you and them. You can put it in the comment section. And so to further show what could have happened to the slave ship Jehovah and the slave master, remember the partners here are the slave hunters and the slave master they still work together and that's exactly why you notice that they don't report on Biafra and Ambazonia because they are all working together and that's why they provide weapons to their slave hunting partners to oppress subjugate and enslave the Negroes that's all you're seeing there if you doubt what we're saying research it and put it in the comment section to indicate that whatever we have found in our own research is not consistent with the reality of today as far as the Negroes are concerned. And so we reference journals of the House of Commons from January the 19th, 1847 in the tenth year of the reign of Queen Victoria to July the 23rd, 1847 in the Elizabeth year of the reign of Queen Victoria, session 1847 and it was printed by the order of the House of Commons. And here we are told what happened to the slave ship Jehovah. And it says about slave vessels. The order made upon the 23rd day of April last for presenting to Her Majesty an humble address that she would be graciously pleased to give directions that there be laid before this house a return showing the particulars of the several disbursements 
constituting the difference between the sums 1152 whatever and 168 whatever paid as the net proceeds of the slave vessels Jehovah and Diana into the vice admiralty court at the Cape of Good Hope on the 12th day of December 1842 and the 8th day of December 1846 respectively our interest is the two slave vessels Jehovah and Diana you can investigate them further yourself but our interest is to show you that there is no way the slave master could have given the Negroes something more powerful than what they had it's impossible when they were looking for them to capture and sell within themselves and further here it shows return of copies of bills disbursements and fees of the marshal of the vice admiralty court of the cape of good hope relative to the slave vessels jehovah and dinah proceeds of sale and date when paid into the register of the high court of admiralty 291 queen's answer 354 and accounts or whatever and it goes further to show return showing the particulars of the disbursements constituting the difference between the sums paid as the net proceeds of the slave vessels Jehovah and Dinah and the gross proceeds of sale of those vessels 409 Queens and 417 those are not our interest our interest is that there were slave vessels called Jehovah and going further remember we are looking at the slave hunters and the slave masters as well as the slaves here and part of this video is to prove beyond any reasonable doubts that it could have been the arrow because they didn't have that capacity and if they did Almost every other book would have mentioned them the same way they are mentioning the Sultan, mentioning the slave masters, the Europeans, the Arabs, and other slave hunters at that time. But then, to show you a little bit of who the Negroes were, remember all the names given to the Negroes today, all the identities they carry, be it in Sub Saharan Africa, in West Africa, or Central Africa, or in the Americas, or Brazil, or anywhere, were all given to them by the slave masters. For example, Yoruba was created by the slave master as Yareba, circa 1808. Igbos refer to all the slaves exported from the path of Benin and Biafra, things like Urobo, things like Benin, things like Ishekiri, Ejo, all those things were concocted by the slave masters. None of those names existed before. So the slave master gives them a name, an identity, to know that they are Negroes and to know who he is dealing with. You may not understand it, you may not believe it, but if you research it, all we challenge you to do is, Put it in the comment section to show how old your ethnic group is. That's all we challenge you to tell us. How old is your ethnic group? Be it Yoruba, be it anything. Because nobody was Yoruba during the slave trade. So there is no way Yorubas can be claiming to have been sold as well. Because what you have as Yoruba today is an integration of Dahomeans, Fulanese, Anagos, Akos, and of course Negroes. And that's how the slave master plays his game. We shall look at that in a different video. But then, let us reference impressions of Western Africa with remarks on the diseases of the climate and a report on the peculiarities of trade up the rivers in the Bight of Biafra by Thomas J. Hutchinson, Esquire, and this was published 1858. And here, we are told that, and this is talking about what you call Southern Nigeria today up to Southern Cameroon. So again, your focus should be on Biafra and Ambazonia. Look at the body language of the slave master. You will understand what they are doing. But even if you don't understand it, we shall explain them to you because they are all documented. But he tells us here that they have the same silly superstitions, a belief in jujus and fetishes as all the races who are uncivilized and unchristianized. Remember, part of the remit of the slave trade was to Christianize the Negroes or Islamize them. Our question to you is, why do you think they did not like whatever the Negroes were practicing? And again, we ask you, why do you think an armed robber that knows he will be coming to rob you would give you a more sophisticated weapon than the one he will be coming with? And it goes further to say, but nothing of the bloodthirsty practices that are engrafted on the idolatry of the natives of the Bight of Biafra. Their language is principally a combination of vowels and from its peculiar nasal pronunciation can rarely be acquired by an Englishman. Remember, today they speak 
any language of the Negroes, but they told you that then they couldn't have. And please remember that if you research this, what you will discover is that they made some of those claims at that time to deceive the Negroes to think that they couldn't understand what they were saying, whereas they learnt the languages, wrote books about them, and came to present it to them as if their spirit, their own God, whatever it was, had given them that inspiration, whereas they learnt them physically themselves in order to be able to deceive the Negroes. And it goes further to say, different nations of them speak different languages. And Captain Adams has justly remarked that the Tower of Babel might have been built on the western shores of Africa as a different language is spoken at every 10 or 12 miles, though these different languages are generally understood by the natives along the coast. So our interest is to ask you, when they tell you about the Tower of Babel, you remember that that Bible verse never said they committed any offense. If you read it very well, you will discover that it is not because they committed any offense or sin. And so, if we quickly looked at Genesis 11.5, we see that it says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. If you check this today, you will see that this is the code that makes them descend on any association formed by the Negroes. If you notice, for example, we use the Biafra agitation as an example. Indigenous people of Biafra is a group. Masob is another group. BIM is another group. BZM is another group. But you notice that the moment the slave master noticed that the Negroes were coming together, he struck and he came in to scatter their language. All the code is telling them is when they come together to do anything, go between them, infiltrate them, and of course scatter them so that they can no longer agree. So if you check something like IPOB, how come the army went to invade in the Kano's house? Why didn't they invade other people's houses? That's who the slave master is. He is walking through his slave hunting partners. Ask yourself this type of army that does not rise in defense of its citizens, be it in Southern Kaduna or anywhere, but will rise against freedom fighters. That should tell you the army is never a national army. It was the slave hunters. It was renamed Nigerian Army in 1863. And from this Premium Times newspaper article, we see that the Nigerian Army celebrated 157 years in 2020. And if you do the mathematics, you will see that from 1863, to 2020 is 157 years and today you are celebrating the nigerian army that was a slave hunting militia that was used to capture and sell your forebears as slaves to the new world and to the old world which is europe and to the middle east and wherever you see that's unfortunate the same way you are worshiping their idols now if you also look at people from southern kaduna if you are somebody from let's say biafra land or southern nigeria the same army that were used to murder your parents, create orphans and widows in your community. You are celebrating the same army with them today. And again, if you are from Southern Kaduna, for example, you are joining them to celebrate the same army that is massacring you and cannot protect you. And you say you are celebrating it with them. Why not ask basic questions like, who was it that formed this army that they are talking about in 1863? And when you do the basic questioning, you will discover that they are lying when they told you that it was Glover. Glover was a naval officer and Lagos was not part of Nigeria until 1907. And for those who may have been following our channel, you notice that the likes of Mr. himself alone and best less casual gamer have not made comments about what their brother El Rufai said that those who post pictures of the destructions by his brothers and are getting help from their own brothers abroad remember whether you believe it or not some of the so-called African Americans are still cognizant of the fact that they had some relationship with the Negroes back in Africa so when they see those pitiful stories of pitiful houses destroyed by the Fulanis who were the slave hunters at that time they are always moved to show some form of humanity for which the Negro is by nature the Negro is human the Negro is love the Negro is everything good you can think about but the slave master found a way to sow the thorns within the Negroes so that when they commit atrocities, you will be thinking, oh, it's black people doing it to themselves. The Fulanese are not considered black people. 
we challenge you to wait. If you went to Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, or any of the slave masters' ivory towers, we challenge you to wait. They are never black people, but they now use them to do certain things and people will be seeing the Negroes in the image of the atrocities of non-Negroes. This was why we asked you severally when the Nigerian government went with a chartered flight to go and bring the Chinese during the early COVID-19 days and they made a show of it. We asked you again and again, what do you think they were doing? What message were they passing? Remember, if they went and took even the whole Chinese to that place, nobody will know. But they made a show of it. What do you think they were doing? That's our question to you. You need to look for answers to that question. And at the same time, the slave masters media were reporting about how they were singling out black people and sending them out of their houses. You should be able to read between the lines. You should be able to connect the dots and understand what the messages are saying. Especially if your child has ever asked you, why is it that it is only us that the police are shooting in the US? That should be a time for you to reflect and ask yourself why. Those are what those messages are supposed to be passing. And then when you look at things like the killings in Southern Kaduna, the killings in what you will call Southern Nigeria today, you ask yourself, why does the slave master's media not report them? But he will be quick to tell you what the Chinese are doing and will also be quick to show you how they invited some so-called doctors which have proven not to be doctors to Nigeria. Those are basic questions you need answers for. Don't listen to us. Don't believe us. We don't need people to believe us. We need people who can investigate, who can research and find things out for themselves. Ask basic questions. And so if you notice that Best Les Kajugema and Mr. Himself alone have not said anything about the comments from El Rufai about getting help from abroad. Remember that he said those that post pictures of the destructions by the Fulanese and they are sent money from people abroad to either rebuild the thousands of churches and houses destroyed or burnt or to bury the dead will be prosecuted and that they were following them. That should tell you who they are. Now they are telling you that you shouldn't ask for help if they burnt your house. Now was this not something akin to what could have happened during the slave trade and they turned around to say the negroes were like animals that you could take away their children they don't care ask yourself if you have not sold your children today what makes you believe that your forebears could have sold theirs okay if we assume but without considering that it's because the slave master is not buying aren't you seeing people that are forced by hardship today to sell their own children so why have you not sold yours and so going further you see where it says from sierra leone we voyage along the Banana and Shaboro Islands and past Cape Mount, a place rendered notorious by its having been so long the residence of the celebrated slave trader Captain Cannot. Have you heard this before? But they are telling you about the error that it is not recorded anywhere that they conducted one slave raid. No single place. But we will see how they came about that lie between the slave master and the slave hunters later in this video. And going forward, it says to Liberia, a colony of free Negroes, the constitution of Liberia, which is now a republic, was begun and fostered by the advice and money of the American Colonization Society to assist liberated Negroes in returning to the land of their forefathers for the purpose of establishing themselves in liberty and independence. Now remember, there is no independence in those things you call West African countries, including Nigeria. That's why you notice that whenever there is an election, the slave master has to rig it in order to put in his slave hunting partners there. If you doubt what we're saying, put it in the comment section and we'll take it from there. And now, to continue from where we stopped in our last two series, looking at who were the slave hunters at that time, let us reference the Journal of Negro History, Carter G. Woodson, editor, volume 2, and published 1917. And here, we are told that the chief, not having a sufficient supply of slaves on hand to trade, caused his big drums to be beaten and organized two bands of troops to execute a raid among the hidden tribes to the east and southwest. The raiding bands attacked only tribes with whom they were at war or who refused to adopt the Mohammedan religion. Now you are telling us that the same people that are coming to capture you were giving you the religion because the, the religion could have protected you from them. It's impossible. It's just like believing an armed robber will give you a machine gun when he will be coming to attack you with the machete. It doesn't make sense and it's impossible. So you see here that they were raiding only tribes that refused to uh, 
doubt the Mohammedan religion or that were at war with them. And of course, remember these were not indigenous to the area. The same things the Fulanis are doing today. And if you go watch that video where the Fulani governor of Kaduna was telling you what they were going to do to those whose houses they destroyed and they sought help from human beings outside Nigeria and how they were going to prosecute them, that will tell you exactly who the slave hunters were and who their descendants today are. It doesn't change. If you notice, those two guys, Mr. himself alone and um, best less casual gamer that were always in defense of the Fulani, they have not made any comment about those because it's their technique. They will stay away for a while and when it looks like they think, based on what the slave master had told them that the Negro's short memory for sorrows would have kicked in, you will see them, they'll come back here. That's who they are. It doesn't change. And he goes on here to say, while the troops were on the war path, the caravan leaders visited the city slave market and made from day to day a few purchases. The price paid for an old Negro was 10,000 to 15,000 calories. Those are not our interest. Our interest is to ask you, why not show us one place where the arrow we are also selling their own? Remember, we will show you how they came with this lie. It doesn't change. It's well documented. The only problem is that the Negroes do not read. They will rather listen to what Masa is saying and the Masa will continue lying to them. And he goes further here to tell us that the seller agreed to take back within three days of the date of the purchase any slaves that proved to have objectionable qualities such as a disease, bad eyes or teeth, or a habit of snoring in sleep. As a rule, slaves that come below Nupe were not sellable for the reason that being unaccustomed to eat salt, it was difficult for them to withstand the regime of the desert. But our interest is for you to take good note of what they are saying. It means these are things that are well known, well documented, things they were doing. Now the arrow is not mentioned anywhere, but the slave master and his slave hunting partners were able to lie against them. Now we ask you. If you claim you are courageous, the slave master claims he is superhuman and he has courage, why is he denying his atrocities? One attribute of a brave person and a straightforward person would have been, the same way they committed the atrocity, they should have owned up to it. At least that way, we will know that they are courageous, not for you to be lying all over the place and still tell us you are superhuman. It doesn't make sense. And so further here to see that the slave master couldn't have brought the real thing to the Negroes but rather the golden calves of Islam and Christianity and Judaism, we see what it says. Also, slaves from certain countries south of Kano were not sellable because they were cannibals. And so you see that the same slave master that claims that the Negroes were eating themselves, they were cannibals, they were murderers, they were everything, wouldn't buy some particular group because they were supposedly cannibals. Why does he do that? Because they are cowards. They were afraid. They know that if you were to buy a murderer, let's say you bought a full and put it in your house, he's going to murder you. The reason they were capturing the Negroes was because the Negroes' way of life at that time was sanctity for human life. They were forbidden from killing people. So that was why they discovered things like anti-bullet, for example. Think about it. The slave master tells you that anti-bullet, which they call Ayetha in southwestern of what is called Nigeria today, and Odieshi in the southeastern part of what is called Nigeria today. And so the slave master tells you that that Odieshi is of the devil and that if you were to have it, you will go to hell. But his bullets and his gun are of God and he can kill you with them. Now, sometimes he tries to tell you they are superstition because he knows he doesn't want you to use them. Now, think about it. If the Negroes could come together and they all have Ayeta or Odieshi to a large extent, Remember, only four or two hundred of them can march to any barracks and take them out. So those are the fears of the slave master. And that is why anywhere he sees the Negroes coming together, be it in IPOP or any other organization, he tries to infiltrate it, he tries to scatter it, he tries to look for a way to make sure he scatters them. He tries to look for a way to disorganize their language in the code akin to that Tower of Babel you see in the slave master's book. And then he goes further here to say the slaves from this region were recognized by their teeth which were sharpened to a point resembling those of a dog. Negroes from other tribes were not purchased because they were believed to have the power of causing a man to die of consumption by merely looking at him. Now if the slave master was not a coward or if the power of the real creator of heaven and earth within them was 
superstition as the slave master deceived them with at that time why is he afraid of some people certainly he was afraid of those he knew that were covered by the grace of the most high but then he needed his golden calf to continue deceiving them which is what they are doing till today and then going further for those who were asking fulanese were also sold you need to understand that there were the real fulanese and the dark ones which were products of their slave women and their men sleeping with the negro women to produce those darker fulanese which you see today some of them still carry the aura of the older fulanese and so here you see that those of them that were sold were actually only sold in error and it goes further here to tell us that the purchase of felatas that's the fulanese or pregnant negro women or jews was strictly forbidden by the sultan so if you read this sentence twice and very well too you will understand something from here beyond what the slave master tells you about judaism and those people you see in israel and all that you need to ask yourself if the negroes were black for example who was enslaving the other how did they know who was who and then gathered on a particular day to leave egypt if the negroes were black then will the slave masters be white or was it blacks enslaving themselves if they were both whites so who was enslaving the other you need to understand that the slave master just has his code recorded in that book the most high creator of heaven and earth never inspired any of those books nor did it write them because the most high didn't need to write books in order to be present in the lives of its children and so it goes further to say the negro women could not be bought because the child to be born would be the property of the sultan if its mother were a heathen and it would be free if the mother were a mohammedan so you see how they were making their converts so not that the power of any supreme being came into it it was pure man's inhumanity to man that was what they used to convert the negroes to islam christianity or judaism but then further down it tells us what we're looking for and it says the raiding troops after having been on the campaign for nearly a month returned with 2000 captives who marched in front of the column the men women old and young almost all nude or half clad in ragged blue cloth and the children piled upon the camels the women were groaning and the children crying while the men though seemingly more resigned bore bloody marks upon their backs made by the whips now you are telling us that it could have been the priest that did all this if he was the priest show us where they did their own at least we have seen where these people are doing theirs and it's telling us here that they were out for a month and they got 2000 captives and then you are telling us that the arab priests could have gotten four to seven hundred from the same locale without horses without camels without scooters and from bush paths and if you still believe that story of how the arrow could have been behind the slave trade it means you're just gullible or it means you can't read because there is nobody that can read the historical records and come out with the story that it could have been the arrow and so he goes further to say the convoy was marched to the palace where its arrival was announced to the sultan by a band of musicians now we ask you show us where the arrow did their own at least we are seeing the sultan here we are seeing where the troops arrived this was published in 1917 show us one place where the arrow had their own slaves and let's look at how possible it could have been without camels without horses and without a standing army like we told you believe it or not the nigerian army was a fulani and islamic slave hunting militia it was only renamed nigerian army in 1863 when they were trying to stop the slave trade if you notice you will see that this was something they did with pride when they are done with this covid 19 when the tension goes down a little we will show you the relationship between what they are doing now and what they were doing then and how their slave hunting partners gave the game away remember we told you that if you wanted to know anything about the pandemic just look at their brainless foot soldiers they will give the game away just look at them that's all you need to do like we told you they lack humanity they lack common sense if you listen to that governor Erufa in kaduna in that interview we showed you in our last video you will see that it clearly shows you who they are you come and destroy somebody's home he asks for help and because some people who look like him help him then you claim you have to prosecute him and put him in jail you might think he's bluffing that's who they are there is no place they are that there can be peace because all they enjoy is what he is talking about that's who they are if you doubt us go and engage him and ask him you will see that even the aggression even his body language will show you who they are 
and you may have noticed where the interviewer asked him in that video whether they had any other solution other than giving the the fulani hartsman money and he said that was the only solution they knew if you think that person asking him didn't know who they are you will be mistaken because that was a polite way of finding out why they were not deploying the army but they know that if you were to ask them what they don't like they will send that army to come and kill you too that's who they are if you are looking at the nigerian media and you think you are getting any truth from them you are missing the point as well they are all controlled the slave master is behind them using his brainless foot soldiers the same way they did the slave trade together and he goes further to say the sultan complimented the chief examined the slaves and ordered them to the slave market and the next morning the caravan leaders were invited to come and make their purchases and now today you're telling us it was the arrow show us where the arrow could have done it now all those people you hear whether they say they are curator of you or whatever rubbish they are talking about most of them are paid to say what they are saying and even if you think they know what they are saying all we challenge you to do is ask yourself how they could have had such a capacity without an army you come and gather 400 to 500 people and they don't mob you Remember at that time the slave master was using his propaganda mastery to deceive the whole world that the Negroes were beasts akin to cattle. They had no languages. They were just as peaceful as cattle. That's what the message was, including in Islam, which we shall look at in a different video. So if you can tell us how the arrow could have done it, we are waiting. Even if you're a professor, you hold a PhD from any of the slave masters ivory towers, we challenge you to wait. Show us how the arrow could have done it without an army. And it goes further to say, after the slave trading was over, it was necessary to purchase supplies of corn, millet, dried meat, butter, and flour for three months, also to purchase camels and hide tents. Doma's caravans, which set out for Metlili with only 64 camels and 16 men, had now increased to 400 slaves and nearly 600 camels. A caravan from the Twat, which had joined that of Dumas, had augmented in the same proportion. It had brought 1,500 slaves, and its camels had increased to 2,000. These two caravans waited two days to be joined by three others, which had penetrated further to the south. So now you are telling us it was the arrow. Meanwhile, the arrow was not mentioned anywhere as behind any of this. And even if they were mentioned anywhere, it never said they were slave hunters. And they don't even have the capacity. The priests in Igbo land, if you go and ask anybody you like, are never young like what you call your reverend fathers and all that today. So it could have been impossible that they did it. If you doubt what we're saying, conduct your research, provide your relevant sources on this channel. We're ready to take you on on that. And it goes further here to say the slaves had to be watched very closely since believing that they were to be eaten by the white men, they were ready to take any chance of escaping. Now remember the reason they are putting this this way was that the Negroes were not considered human at that time. They did not have a language, they did not wear clothes, they lived on trees. That was how that story came. When you see them today talking about black people as animals, that's how it came. So when you see anyone today, whether a professor or an illiterate or anyone creator of Ubinopabi or a writer like the likes of Adobe, Trisha Moban, claiming that it could have been her great-grandfather or the arrow, just know that there are people paid by the slave master to misinform everyone with their lies. If you look at it and if you read all these materials, you will see that it is impossible that an individual could have done it. It can only be by the army. And then we ask you again, if the Nigerian army is 157 years in 2020, what was it doing before Nigeria came into existence if we assume but without considering that Nigeria was allegedly amalgamated in 1914 or established as a British colony in 1900, whichever one you chose, we ask you again today, what do you think necessitated the creation of the so-called Nigerian army in 1863, long before Nigeria was allegedly created? And please remember that they claimed that it was when Glover, a British naval officer, took 18 houses or whatever number of houses to Lagos that the army was created in 1863. But like we told you, the slave hunters and their descendants, they lack humanity, they lack common sense. In that lie, they forgot that Lagos was not part of Nigeria until 1907 or 1906 thereabout when it was amalgamated to become part of southern Nigeria. But you see how subtle the slave master is. 
but he was still able to sell the dummy because the Negroes listen to what Masai is saying. They don't analyze things at all. And he goes further to say, the women were tied in twos by the feet and the men tied eight or ten together, each with his neck in an iron collar to which was attached a short chain which held the hand of each slave at the height of his chest. At night, Domas fastened to his wrist the chains which bound all his slaves together so that the least movement would wake him. And so it goes further here to say, in a short time, the three expected caravans arrived. One had originally come from Jidamis, one from Gat, and one from Fezan. The first had gone as far as Nupe. It brought back 3,000 slaves and 3,500 camels. The second had gone to Kano and returned with 400 to 500 or 500 slaves and 700 or 800 camels. The third returned from Sokoto and had about the same number of slaves and camels as the second. And he goes further to say, after the proper ceremonies of farewell at the palace of the Sultan, the camels were loaded and the children placed upon the baggage. The Negro men chained together were placed in the middle of each caravan and the women were grouped eight or ten together and guarded by a man with a whip. The signal was given and the great combined caravan consisting in all of about 6,000 slaves and 7,500 camels started on their homeward march. Now you are telling us it was the arrow. Show us one place where the arrow could have done it. Don't be deceived by these authors that are like Origi or Okeji who claim that it could have been the arrow without looking at historical records. They are just paid by the slave master. Those are controlled scholars. There is no better way to put it. All you need to do is research the things yourself and you see what we are talking about. And he goes on to say, but suddenly there was a mighty noise of crying and groaning, of calling at each other and bidding farewell to friends. Some were so overcome at the fear of being eaten that they rolled upon the ground and absolutely refused to work. Nothing could persuade them to get up until a guard came along with his great whip which brought blood at each lash. As the great army passed through the gate of the city, an officer of the Sultan examined every slave to be sure none was a Felata, Mohammedan or Jew. The guard caravan happened to have among its slaves a Felata, and Felata here means Fulani, who was at once discovered and set free. Now we ask you today, read this again and tell us if it's not the same thing as the Fulani herdsmen killing people all over the place. Why the army, which was a slave hunting militia of the Fulani, is chasing freedom fighters who have no arms. Ask yourself, why would somebody who is armed with military experience, military weapons, public funds are paying the salaries of the army? In fact, the so-called IPOB are the people paying the army. The army, the full army do not manufacture anything. So there is no place they make money from. And so the army is paid by public funds. But then they come and attack freedom fighters and leave those that are killing people. And you still can see the relationship, the synergy between the full army herdsmen killing people, Boko Haram, and the slave hunting army called Nigerian army. If you still don't get how they are and who they are, it means you have not taken time to study these materials yourself. And so when you claim that it could have been the arrow, you see that you are just making the Negroes look stupid because the full is, it can be justified. They are Arabs, they are not Negroes. So if they were selling Negroes, it's understandable to believe that they were selling people that were not like theirs. You notice here that when they saw a full in the midst of the slaves, he was freed. Now you are telling us that the Igbos were so foolish that they were capturing themselves, murdering their aged people. Now, if supposedly a pagan goes to capture slaves in another pagan's house and is killing them, believing that they had powers of witchcraft, what does that tell you? Does that make sense to you? That was why we started to show you why the slave master gave the Negroes his golden calves, which they think is the real thing, whereas they are just the golden calves. There is no power in those religions of the slave master. And if you think there is any power in them, we challenge you to prove that to us. Let us also reference Hausa or 1500 miles through the central Sudan by Charles Henry Robinson, MA, Trinity College, Cambridge, and this was published 1896. And here we are told that retracing our steps through the rows of stalls which we have already examined we come to 
that which to a European is the most distressing place in Kano, the slave market. Now we ask you, show us where the slave market was around Aro and not telling us that somebody came to Aro and then disappeared. And that's how they got four to five hundred, six hundred or seven hundred men, women and children in a slave ship. Show us how it could have happened. If one person comes to Aro, they become four hundred men, women and children in a slave ship in Bonnie. Show us where that is documented and how possible it is that one man could just get to Aro. They claim he disappeared if we assume but without considering that that narrative is true. And then he appears in Bonnie with men, women and children that didn't come to Aro. We want to know how possible that is. And it goes further to say the usual number of slaves on sale is 500. Today, however, this number has been largely increased as the king has recently returned bringing with him a thousand new slaves, the result of a month's raiding in the southern part of the territory over which he himself rules. After selecting the nicest looking slaves for his personal use and presenting a certain number to his friends, he has sent the rest to the markets to be sold for his benefit. We have thus the opportunity of comparing the appearance of those who have just been reduced to slavery with those who have been sold and resold and have been carried far from their original homes. Now remember, many Europeans came out of curiosity to see how these people could have been selling themselves. That's the people you are seeing their accounts. But the slave master is a subtle beast. So that's why he's interested in elections in Nigeria. If you notice when John Kerry, Obama were in power, you see John Kerry going to Sokoto. Why not ask yourself, is the you well in Sokoto? No. But then they have to go there because those are the people they have alliances with. The same way they had during the slave trade. Their forefathers wrote it down for them. You are busy accusing your forebears of having sold you when you know that it's impossible to sell a man. The only reason you believe that garbage is because you're gullible. If you read the accounts, you will know that it's impossible. Otherwise, why have you not sold your own children then? So when you see the likes of John Kerry, you see Tony Blair, you see all of them heading to Sokoto, it is not because they are stupid. It is because their forefathers had told them that these were our slave hunting partners. Go there, give them toys, give them drinks. They will kill the Negroes for you. That's all they are doing. It doesn't take any magician to decipher so that's why they gave you the golden calf now if you are in southern Kaduna, you're a christian or you are in biafra land and you're a christian or muslim has the imams in mecca or the pope or the archbishop of canterbury spoken about the killings the answer is no because they are all in it together and remember if you expect your bishops or imams to speak up they cannot speak up because they are also paid by the slave master system if the bishop says we won't attend churches again unless this is addressed they will stop paying his salary because you will no longer be coming to church to put offering from where his salaries are paid so that's why you see that they also can speak about it but you notice that you will see the archbishop of canterbury with buhari visiting him in london and all that does he ever talk about the killings so what does it take you to figure out that the slave master couldn't have given you anything more than the golden calf which is what is coded in that story anyway and he goes further to say one or two of the former still wear chains attached to their hands or feet but in most cases this has not been regarded by the owners as necessary owing to the extreme difficulty which a slave would have in escaping even if he could get clear of the market or the city sitting or rather crouching in the front row are several young children with a look of terror and misery on their faces their fathers were probably killed in the midnight raid upon their village their mothers have been separated from them forever and have perhaps gone to swell the harem of the king or one of his ministers. Now we ask you if you don't still understand what is going on. The same way they told you is the arrow. It's the same way you hear some people today tell you that IPOB is a terrorist group. Whereas Fulani hurts men, they don't talk about them. Out of Stockholm Syndrome, out of the fact that the Negro is a born slave. It's the same thing. You see who is doing it. But you see, because the Negro is a born slave, he will rather face his brothers. If you notice some groups, some people that are attacking in Nandekano, telling you that, oh no, he is in fear, there is no killing of Fulani. You notice that the same people telling you that there is no Fulani killing also see Southern Kaduna. You notice that their stories are also always the same. When you ask them, what do you mean? Aren't you seeing this? They will ask you, what of Igbo man? Has an Igbo man been killed? They forget that those are the reasons why blacks are singled out, be it in the US or anywhere. Because if at home 
your supposed brothers are treating you like this. Remember, they are not brothers with the full and it doesn't matter how you think about it. If you research it, you see that they are not Negroes. So if your brothers are treating you like this, why should we treat you any better? That's ideally telling us that somebody who you know the parents detest, they abuse, will come to you and you treat him better. Unless you have humanity in you, it's impossible. That's what those images are supposed to show you. Otherwise, they could have killed any number of black people or Negro people and show nobody. But the reason they show it is to give that image a lasting effect on the minds of people. And it goes further to say one or two of them are apparently too young to realize what has happened and are playing and laughing together. Of the older slaves belonging to the same group, some have a look of despair which is more piteous to see than the most acute misery. They are under no illusions but know full well what slavery will mean to them. Their free happy life has been exchanged for uncertainty, ill treatment and unhappiness. But this is not our interest. Our interest is for you to see how it was done. So when they tell you that your forefathers could have sold their children, sold their wives and all that and you believe simply because you are gullible. Let us also reference British Nigeria. A geographical and historical description of the British positions adjacent to the Niger River, West Africa, by Lieutenant Colonel A. F. Mokla Ferryman, and he is a barrister at law, and this was published in 1902. And here we are told that so far we have been speaking only of the pagan tribes in the vicinity of the coast, amongst whom slave raiding is not carried on to anything like the extent that it is among the Mohammedans further inland. Now we ask you, they are saying it is not carried in the coast the same way it is done by the Mohammedans, but still it is the arrow. Tell us how, without an army, whereas these guys have 16,000 cavalry with which they conduct the slave raids. If you see the army today, you have seen the slave hunters. Even how they behave should tell you. If you saw that interview from El Rufai, it's enough to tell you who the slave hunters were. He is telling you that we destroy your home, kill your siblings, and you manage to escape and send the pictures to some people to render help to you. Then we prosecute you and you still can't get what he's saying and who he is. And he goes further here to say, in the Mohammedan countries, i.e. the greater part of northern Nigeria, slave raiding is a profession followed by every Mohammedan who can muster a band of armed men. Now, you are telling us that the Arrow didn't need armed men to do this. Even if you claim it was Abam warriors, show us where one place is recorded that they conducted slave raids. That's all we want to see. And then he goes further to say, their objects are to capture as many pagans as they can, either returning them as camp and domestic servants or disposing of them by public sale. A very large number also are required for the payment of tribute by the smaller chiefs to their superiors and in the Sokoto Empire where each year the fuller raiders have to travel further south to make their captures, the devastation of pagan villages is almost incredible. And you are telling us is the arrow. Tell us where and how possible it could have been. If you are looking at the number of villages that are being destroyed in the slave raids and you are telling us that the arrow got millions of Igbos from the same community and the same locale where they are domiciled at that time, then something must be wrong with your ability to reason. And it goes further down to say the mayor of Adamawa, it is said, until quite recently sent 10,000 slaves annually to the sultan of Sokoto. Now show us where the arrow got their own. You can't tell us, but you are telling us they could have been behind it. Now, if you look at things today, you will see that the Igbos are more commercial than the Fulanese. The Fulanese are a bit on the thriftless side. It is through them that the slave master can come and destroy your farm, destroy your environment, steal the oil and nothing happens. And if you talk, they send their slave hunting army to come and kill you. And you still can't get the code. And going further, it says the distance is roughly 800 miles and the hardships endured on a journey of this length must have been so great that probably not one half of those who left Yola reached Warno. This is only one of a score of instances and to testify to the number of pagans who are continually being captured, we have the evidence of Mr. C.H. Robinson who had every opportunity during his residence of three months in Kano of looking into the state of affairs. He tells us that parties of Mohammedans were constantly arriving with gangs of newly captured slaves 
and that on one occasion he saw upwards of a thousand captives brought in by a single raiding party. We know also what went on in Nupe only five years ago and it is the same in all these Mohammedan states. Slaves as matters stand are a necessity and they must be obtained at all costs. Consequently, there must be perpetual raiding. But the slave tribute, enormous as it is, does not account for a tithe of the pagans captured and the remainder go to the slave market which exists in every town of any size. Here they find a ready sale. Their purchasers employing them either as domestic servants, laborers or carriers. The more land a man possesses, the more slaves he requires to cultivate it, and the larger his household, the greater number of harem attendants, concubines and servants, though perhaps the majority of the slaves are employed as carriers or what they may be termed beasts of burden. And now you are telling us it was the Aro. Show us where the Aro had their own farms, where they kept their own slaves. That's all we want you to do. Because this lie has to stop. Every lie has an expiry date. And that is why we are challenging you today to show us how it could have been the Aro. Where are their troops? If you claim it was Abam warriors, who were they? Where are they today? Where did they conduct the slave raid that you know about? And please don't get this wrong, if you were to look at the Biafra and Ambazonia agitations today, you will see that the same foolishness is replaying, where the Fulani herdsmen are killing people, Boko Haram are killing people. Then the Nigerian army, which was a slave hunting terror group until renamed and given uniform, now came out and jumped out from nowhere in a supposed democracy to claim that those asking for freedom are terrorists. And some people are buying into the rubbish because they are gullible. The same thing they did as slave hunters. We challenge you. Tell us what was Nandekano's crime, for example. What was his crime? Just tell us what his crimes are and tell us why people like the Sultan are not talking about the killings going on. Because he was the wholesale merchant in Negro slaves. Go and investigate. That's all you need to do. Then challenge us with your own facts. And to further show you that it was a joint venture between the slave master and his slave hunting partners, which is what they are practicing till today. Again, we ask you, why do you think the slave masters media of the BBC, VOA and Al Jazeera do not report the killings by their slave hunting partners. And so let us reference the suppressed book about slavery prepared for publication in 1857, never published until this present time which we think is about 1864 thereabout. And here we are told that why then prohibit the African slave trade under such a penalty? Why not give unlimited encouragement to it? Why not let Christian philanthropy be as broad as the Atlantic and Africa be depopulated afresh? Take note of that, depopulated afresh. But then, you are still believing that the slave hunter and the slave master are not the same people working together against the Negroes. And he goes further to say, what? Put to death those benevolent men who kidnap benighted heathens for their good. What? Brand those as pirates who forcibly remove the natives of Guinea to the plantations of Carolina. Seeing the result will be their temporal and everlasting welfare. Is not this the command of Christ? Go ye into all Africa and seize as many of its wretched inhabitants as you can by fraud and violence, that they may be taken to slaveholding America, where my gospel is proclaimed. The Reverend Mr. Bushell, an American missionary on the western coast of Africa for 13 years, in a letter to the New York Evangelist in March 1857 says, The slave trade is the great cause of Africa. It renders the wildest savages still more fierce and cruel and baffles all attempts at civilization. Of course, all other commerce is killed by this traffic. The country is rich in natural products and might furnish a large export, but all is kept down by this one trade. The moment a British squadron hovering on the coast puts the slavers in fear and causes their trade to languish, other branches of industry revive. Now remember, the slave trade was replaced by palm oil, coal and then oil today. If you notice, the slave hunters do not allow any other sector thrive in Nigeria except the oil sector. And even when they brought in things like telecommunication, it was for the slave master to come in 
and rip or make slaves of their people like we told you believe it or not the nigerian army like the armies in those regions were the slave hunters of old they were just given uniforms they lack humanity they lack common sense that is why the slave master is always fighting to put an army to head or rule places like nigeria if you notice the sultan that is there today was also in the army and so to show you how the same way john kerry visited and visits and the likes of Tony Blair and the slave masters visit the Sultan today because that's their slave hunting partner, how they did it in the past. Let us reference letters and sketches from Northern Nigeria by Martin S. Kish with an introduction by Sapasu Girod. And this Sapasu Girod was the Canadian that succeeded Lugard when he left from Northern Nigeria to come and assume leadership of all Nigeria. By then they had annexed the South. Remember the South was like a slave farm which you don't need to believe us, you just need to go research it and we will explain it to you when we tell you why they are fighting for one Nigeria so that if you are in the south joining them, you will understand that you are just being a fool. And this was published in 1910 and here we are told that the Sultan was very friendly to them and Denham, who remained some time in Bono, was allowed to accompany the Sultan's troops on various expeditions and slave raids. Thus learning a great deal about the country and the people. Meanwhile, Clapperton and Odney pushed on to Kano, but before their arrival, Odney died of consumption. Our interest is for you to see that the slave masters are usually at home when they visit their slave hunting partners. Do you know anyone in the south that the slave master visits? The answer is no. But then you will think that the oil is in the south. The oil is in the south. It can be in the south. Anything can be there. But the slave master understands that his slave hunting partners, they have no regard for the Negroes or their lives. So all they need is to give them guns, give them whatever they need and take whatever they want. And if you talk as a Negro, they will kill you and nothing will happen. You saw Erufai telling you that when the Fulani is destroy your homes and you post pictures of the destruction and people send you money, they will prosecute you. That should tell you who they are. You don't need to go to conduct research like a Harvard graduate or Oxford or Cambridge. You just need to read the meanings from there. And before we round up, you might just be wondering how could they have just framed the arrow and nobody is pointing them out, even though many, including Professor Chinwiza, had pointed all these out over the years. But like we told you, the slave master controls the area through his slave hunting partners. So they will only have the books containing their lies in the academic curriculum. So when you say anything outside what children were taught from childhood, it will now look like a lie because when a lie is told often enough it begins to look like the truth so let us quickly reference nigeria by walter schwartz this was published in 1968 which is above the 1950 that we always look at you will see where it tells us some stories about nigeria that we all know are lies and it says the coming of islam nigeria entered the mainstream of history in the 12th century which we know is a lie with the conversion of Islam of Ume Jilami, the ruler of Kanem. But by that time, the Kanem Bornu state was an extensive and powerful divine hereditary kingdom with an elaborate palace, hierarchy within which the Queen Mother had a position of special power. An official historian said of one of the 12th century sultans of Bornu that his horses numbered 100,000, his soldiers were 120,000, not counting mercenaries. Among his noble acts were pilgrimages to the sacred house of God on two occasions. On his first pilgrimage, he left in Egypt 300 slaves, and on his second, a like number. Now we ask you, if he left 300 slaves in Egypt in the whatever century, whenever he traveled, are those people Fulani? They are Negroes, and Fulanis are not Negroes. Going further here, it tells us another lie. It says Yoruba kingdoms. To the south, the great Yoruba kingdom of Oyo emerged in the late 13th century. Now again, there was no word like Yoruba before 1808. If you doubt what we're saying, investigate and come back here and tell us where you found it. But then, it was not even Yoruba, it was Yariba that they created it as. But you see how they create a place and then they give it a history, they write it themselves. It goes further to say, little definite is known of its beginnings. Samuel Johnson, the Anglican pastor at Oyo, who in the late 19th century wrote history of the Yorubas, still the only comprehensive 
account of their history admitted that there was no clear dividing line between legend and fact. All indications are that Ile Ife, near the modern town of Ife, was the cultural and probably also the political source of the empire. The most remarkable survival from Ife Kingdom are its unique bronzes and terracotta figures. But our interest is to show you that Destiny is writing here that it was in the 13th century that Oyo emerged. They are all lies. There is no truth in them. But like we told you, the slave master will give it a history and continue his control from there. This Johnson mentioned here in the history of Yoruba, when he submitted the manuscript for the book, they never published it until he died. They now published what they wanted. If you doubt us, investigate and put it in the comment section here. We are waiting. And so here is our main interest about the arrow and the slave trade. And it says, slaves became profitable after the discovery of the new world had established a seemingly insatiable demand for workers on the plantations. Slavery was not new to Africa, but it had existed primarily in its domestic form, involving rights as well as duties. In Bono, the kings sent slaves to govern their provinces and Hausa kings also often ruled through slaves. Now we've never had that before, if you believe it is true or if you can explain it to us, please do. We don't know of a situation where supposedly slaves are now rulers. See how they claim that slaves rule. Now slavery, according to them, was anything you were doing at that time to make money was slavery to the slave master and for him, the Igbos we are all slaves. Everything about the Igbos were just slaves. So that's why you notice that everyone he sees, he will tell you that this was a slave. Now, ordinarily, if you look at it logically, you will see that he was ideally referring to who he sees them as and not who they really were. And he goes further to say, in Yoruba land, slaves of the Alafin often attend great power. It was the Europeans who turned slavery into an industry and introduced such well-documented barbarities as the rigors of the Middle Passage across the Atlantic. In return for copper bars, pewter, tankards, blue linen, spirits, and other imports, perhaps 24 million slaves were exported from West Africa and Angola in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Some 22,000 were shipped annually from Nigerian ports alone in the 17th century. Now we ask you, even based on the number, which is conservative, 22,000 could have been shipped from Nigerian ports, which you know is in Boni, in Calabar, and Badagri. You are telling us that the Aro were now the ones in charge of Badagri. If they were not, tell us who were behind the slaver spots from Badagri. But then here it goes further to say the Europeans could not capture the slaves for themselves. Take note of this, which is a lie. We had shown several relevant sources prove that they came in and were slave hunters themselves physically. And it goes further to say, but depended on African middlemen who dealt with the interior. These middlemen trade deeply marked Southern Nigerian history both in the slave era and in the palm oil era which replaced it in the 19th century it is responsible for the rise of the trading city states of the niger delta highly organized and often despotically governed commercial communities which in their heyday became wealthy and powerful at first they provided the european traders with the indispensable service but later the europeans sought to cut out these middlemen in one case, it was the other way around. A middleman tried to export direct to England. The ensuing quarrels hastened the start of British colonization. But our interest is where he claimed that they could not capture the slaves for themselves. Now, remember, the important keyword there is capture. But we had shown severally that the Europeans were the slave hunters themselves. Remember, when he started in 1434, a Portuguese named Gonzalez or Gonzalez captured the first negro slaves so how did it now become that they could not capture it anymore themselves when the people didn't even know what they were talking about they didn't have the same language so they learned their language and then started telling them to start capturing themselves if you notice you see that that doesn't make sense but if you have any doubts that it was the europeans that did the capturing along with the arabs the moors the barbers the tuaregs 
please put it in the comment section we can revisit it again the same way we are revisiting this one remember we had made videos about this in the past and before we round off here is what it says about the arrow it says the eastern region was by no means homogeneous the Igbo constituted less than 70 percent of a population approaching 13 million see chapter 7 page 157 to 64 whatever traditionally a people of small units the Igbo are subdivided into 30 sub tribes 69 clans and 500 village groups however professor dk the Igbo historian has pointed out that beneath the apparent fragmentation of authority lay deep fundamental unities not only in the religion and cultural spheres but also in matters of politics and economics as among the yoruba deities are held in common and many clans have more than local character the aro clan have a traditional preeminence and authority based on their famous and lucrative oracle at arochuku also prominent are the newi and the onisha these both have hereditary kingdoms but for the most part Igbo have no important hereditary chiefs prominent citizens take titles late in life to add to their prestige they pay money for the honor the Igbo are perhaps nigeria's most natural democrats then he goes further to say clannishness is an important factor in Igbo politics azikiwe is from onisha obara to whom he handed over the premiership in 1957 is from Omoaya. The change of premier inevitably meant a massive transfer of patronage from Onisha people to those of Bende division. The trend was reversed again after the 1966 coup when Colonel Ojuku from Nnewi came to power. Now this is not our interest. Our interest is where he mentioned the arrow. Remember he mentioned that they were just the priests of Arochuku. We shall look at this in a subsequent video and then look at how they came about talking about the arrow being the slave hunters. Remember, this was a hatched plan between the slave master and his slave hunting partners because there is no way the arrow didn't have that capacity. If you look at the areas covered, you will see that it's impossible that they could have done it. Again, you notice that the slave master being a subtle beast was able to use his slave hunting partners to deceive everyone about who was behind it so if we looked at hawkins voyages during the reigns of henry the eighth queen elizabeth and james the first by clement r markham and this was published 1878 we see that this hawkins was the captain of the slave ship jesus and yet his people celebrate him whereas the negroes believe that their own forebears could have been the ones that sold their siblings without asking basic questions or even without reading the accounts of their own forefathers or those that were against the slave trade so we we'll see what it tells us here that no blame attaches to the conduct of john hawkins in undertaking a venture which all the world in those days looked upon as legitimate and even as beneficial it was in 1517 that Charles V issued royal licenses for the importation of Negroes into the West Indies and in 1551 a license for importing 17,000 Negroes was offered for sale. But today we see them running after some people like Adobe Tricia Moban to write that her great grandfather could have done it. Let her show us the army they used. But in any case, we encourage you to find time to look for these materials and study them yourself. And of course, here we come to the end of this edition of The Slave Master, The Slave Hunter and The Slave Part 3. We thank you very much for listening and we encourage you to at least find time to look for the ones we referenced here and other ones written at that time or by the slaves or former slaves themselves and see what you can find. Thank you very much once again for listening. Peace.